Here we go. I'm excited about this message today and what God's got in store for us. But can we just pray? Can we just begin in prayer? Is that okay? Can we do that in church? That's cool, right? All right, let's pray. God, we just thank you for meeting with us today. We thank you that you are so good and that you are so awesome and that, God, that, that, that you are a reason to wake up and to uh, just give up a morning to come and celebrate and worship you, my goodness. What an, what an awesome opportunity that we have. So again, God, just speak to us this morning. Do something awesome in this service, Lord. God, prepare our hearts for what you have from your word today for us to hear. And we love you, Jesus, and it is in your awesome name that we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. All right, so Exodus chapter 17. That's where we're going to be back in Exodus 17. Um, And my title for today is Moses, Hands Held High. Everybody know what story I'm talking about, or most people with hands held high? We'll get to that here in a few minutes. And again, if you're new here or you don't really understand this whole simple series, simple means uh, clear, not complicated, easy to understand, simplified, transferable principles. What we are doing is we're taking well-known stories from Scripture and just trying to extrapolate out some really simple truths that we can not only transfer into our lives and hopefully find some application with those, but as well have those to where we can have them in an elevator speech. And I love being able to share the gospel and have big, long conversations with people. But at the end of the day, oftentimes you have 30 seconds to share your faith or to share your testimony with somebody or to share what God's doing in your heart. And that's what we're trying to find here in this simple series is, you know, what are some really simple truths that I can hang on to that I can use for myself and that I could possibly offload to others? So here we go. Verse 8 in Exodus chapter 17. It says, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Now, if you remember last week, we left the Israelites and Moses in Rephidim. That was the place where they were just complaining against God and against Moses. They needed water. Now, I'm a big fan of water, all right? And when you get thirsty, you want to drink. So imagine going days without having anything to drink. So they were, they were complaining. I wasn't saying it was right, but... I mean, they had a valid concern of not having water. So they get to this place, they're complaining, and God tells Moses to strike this rock. And we saw a picture of a rock. We don't know if it was the one, uh, but Moses struck the rock, water poured out of it, uh, and they got it. But because of their complaining... The, the, the story just kind of ended. There was no big glorious, and God was so good, and they praised God. That didn't happen. And in fact, uh, uh, other place in First Corinthians, we looked, and basically, because of their sin and just just blaming God for everything, many of them just died out in the wilderness before reaching the promised land. So that's where we left off last week here in Rephidim. Well, we have this group of people called the Amalekites. And it says, the Amalekites came and attacked them at Rephidim. Now, this was, it's important to understand, this was an unprovoked attack, all right? And scripture has a lot to say about unprovoked attacks or picking on weaker people or just kind of being dishonest. Proverbs especially has a lot to say about that. But anybody know who the Amalekites were and why in the world would this group of people just come and automatically um, attack the Israelites? Well, the Amalekites were kind of this nomadic Bedouin tribe that kind of moved from place to place, and they, they mainly inhabited the Sinai Peninsula and, and the south of Canaan. And so when the Israelites entered into the Sinai Peninsula, going down to the bottom uh, near Mount Sinai is where they are now in Rephidim. Uh, The Amalekites, they came and uh, and attacked them. But uh, I I guess it's really important to understand who really were they? Why would they come and attack them? And if you look through Scripture, the Amalekites keep showing up, and they're kind of this very important picture all throughout Scripture. Well, the Amalekites were the descendants of, anybody know? Amalek. And you're like, oh, okay, I get it. Like, No right? Okay. Does anybody know who Amalek was? Okay. Amalek was the grandson of Esau. 
okay, now is it, are we starting to put the puzzle pieces together? So we have Jacob and Esau, brothers, right? And did they have some problems, right? We talk about family problems. I mean, these guys were always butting heads. Jacob was cheating Esau out of his birthright and his blessing. And, and Jacob had to actually you know, flee and leave or Esau was gonna kill him. Um, and so there was this strife. Now, later on down the road, I think it's Genesis 33, um, they kind of get back together and they reconcile, but it seems that the family of uh, Esau and Amalek, his grandson, kind of took odds against Israel. So there was this, this constant fighting between these two people. Um, and they had, the Amalekites, they had this reputation of being ruthless, godless people, people of the flesh as Esau was, as uh, scripture describes him. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 and 18, it says, remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. Now, so Moses is recounting our story for today. He's like, remember what happened? Verse 18, when you were weary and worn out, They met you on your journey, and and here it is, and attacked all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. So not only did these people, the Amalekites, come and and do this unprovoked attack, but they didn't meet them head to head. They didn't at least, you know, send a delegation out and say, hey, we're going to go to war with you. You better suit up. Nothing. They came around from the rear and there was, we don't know how many Israelites there were, a million, a couple million, hundreds of thousands. And so there would be stragglers that would maybe be a day or two behind or however that were, maybe they were sick, maybe they had, you know, children they, that they couldn't keep up with the main group. And what the Malachites were doing was coming from behind and picking off all of the weary people that were kind of stragglers in that. And that's, again, scripture has a lot to say about um, picking on weaker people and and all of that. So that kind of gives us an example or a clue into who these people are. So verse 9, Moses said to Joshua, now pause here for a second, really interesting. This is the first mention of Joshua in all of Scripture. All right, so Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow, I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Now, remember, last week, we talked about the staff. We talked about how important that was. It was the same staff when Moses met Jesus in the burning bush, right? And he said, take your staff, throw it on the ground. It turned into a snake, grab it by the tail. He grabbed it, and it became a staff again, right? And then it was the same staff that he took, and he hit the Nile River, and it turned to blood. So it was, the staff was not this magic wand necessarily. It was more of um, this, this picture given to Moses to remind them of three things, God's power, God's presence, and God's personal involvement in their lives. So that's what the staff represented. Again, it, it wasn't some good luck charm that they had. This staff that he had was an actual picture of, hey, God saying, I am with you. So that brings us to our first point. And I kind of went kind of 180 on this point because this isn't what's happening in Scripture. But it really made me think about this, is that simple followers of Jesus don't use God as a good luck charm. And I see this a lot, and it's like we, we often think that God is this thing that we add into our lives to make our lives better, and guess what? That is not what God is for. It, it, that, that is not just God is an additive in what we already have going on. And so we often, and, and the best of us, often kind of fall into this trap of using God as a good luck charm. And I see this in a couple of different ways. The first way I see it is, is like religious items. Like, I mean, let's face it. The, the business of religious items is a humongous business. Like, I can go, not to pick on Winn-Dixie, but I can go right to Winn-Dixie, and I can buy candles, and they have Jesus on them and Mary on them and, and all these different patron saints, and, and I guess if you light this candle, you pray to that patron saint. Like, show me that in the Bible where that's a thing. And so we, we've kind of gotten away from just worshiping God to worshiping things, 
and, and having like these good luck charms. Again, and, and the picture is adding some God into our lives to get what we want. Now, I, I, I've seen this in, in kind of religious articles like trying to think of an extreme example. that You've probably seen it in movies or you may have even seen this in real case. Like think of a gang member. Like, like a bad dude, menace to society kind of guy, right? With a big old cross tattoo on his arm and then Jesus on this arm and he's wearing a big old cross charm. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with tattoos or tattoos of a cross or Jesus or cross charm. I'm not, that's not my point here. What I'm saying is, is they, they have this kind of appearance about some God stuff or Jesus stuff in their lives, but you look at their lives and it's like, uh, am I missing something here? Like, it's, your life isn't matching what is portrayed on your body. And again, so we use God as like this, this good luck charm. So now there's a, another way that, that we do this is that we see God oftentimes as like this genie in a bottle. And we, and we talk about this a lot, and we we, you know, we don't need God in our regular lives. I mean, that's my life. Like, okay, he'll get Sunday morning. Okay. I mean, unless the weather's really nice, then, you know, but, but like, he'll get a little bit of my time, but, but when I need God, man, I'm going to pull him off of the shelf and I'm going to do this and, and make my three wishes. It's kind of a silly example, but we do that. I mean, we constantly do that. We kind of just put God to the side in our lives until we really need him for something. And then we're all about Jesus then. And then if we do get what we want or that, that thing subsides that we're praying about, well, then just kind of put Jesus off to the side again. And see, simple followers of Jesus don't use God as a good luck charm. We don't get to use God for our benefit at our beck and call. And scripture talks so much about this. Two iconic verses. I, I, it feels like I use these verses about every other week, and maybe I do, I don't know, I don't really care. But Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, hopefully we'll, we'll really, really, really get these verses. Trust in the Lord with how much? All your heart. Okay, cool, you're tracking along. And lean not on your own understanding in all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. See, God is not this part-time thing that we add into our lives, whether it's just for good luck or when we just need him. It is supposed to be all about Jesus in our lives. And, and by the way, straight paths is God's path, and that is the path that you want. I promise you, you want God's path in your life. All of those things that you're chasing after, all of those things that bring you like a moment of happiness, and then it's just like, well, I gotta search for the, the newest thing because you're searching for things and you're neglecting God, the thing that is right in front of you that will actually bring fulfillment in your life. So we need to rely on, press into, pray to, and plead with God, not because you need stuff, but because you want relationship with him. See, that's the goal. Not, not just because you, you, you might need something, because you want to have a relationship with your heavenly father. That's why in all of our ways we submit to him. He'll direct our paths. We'll be so close to him. We'll know what God's will is because we'll be so in tune with him. Not just so we can get wishes granted. God is not a good luck charm to help you better your life. Verse 10. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses Aaron and Hur went to the top of the hill. Now, pause for a second. Who is Hur? Now, take note, it's H-U-R, not H-E-R. She's different, okay? But Hur must have been some kind of a, a, a well-known person in Scripture, 
because normally scripture doesn't just make a mention and then just leave it alone. So uh, it does tell us elsewhere that he was the son of Caleb. Now, it's not the Caleb like Joshua and Caleb. It was another Caleb. Um, But according to Josephus, who was this Jewish historian, he lived shortly after Jesus, her was married to Miriam. Who was Miriam? What relation to Moses was she? That was Moses' sister. So we believe, according to Josephus, her was Moses' brother-in-law. Okay, just kind of a cool connection there. Um, so, so Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and her went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Pretty interesting uh, bit of the story there. Brings us to our second point. Simple followers of Jesus know we have victory in battle when our focus is on the Lord. Now, you would be right in saying, Trevor, this point pops up probably every other week right there along with Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Yes, it does. And it kind of reminds me, have you guys heard the story about the preacher that preached about stealing chickens? Okay, so there was this preacher in this old country town, just a real small town, a real small little church, and everybody from the town went to the church. And this preacher, and he gets up, and you know, he's, he's a great preacher. He preaches relevant things, and so he preaches a message about stealing chickens. Nobody thinks a thing of it. Next week comes, he gets up there, he gives this message, and he preaches about stealing chickens. People are like, I, I, I think he talked about that last week, but I don't know. Third week comes, and he gets up there, and he preaches about stealing chickens. And this goes on and on, and people are like, man, is the pastor slipping? What's going on? He's forgetting. Maybe he's just being lazy. He's just repeating his same message. So this one guy who was kind of offended that he kept preaching the same message, he goes up to him, he says, hey, um, pastor, I just need to know, when are you going to stop preaching about stealing chickens? And he looks right at the guy, and he says, when you stop stealing chickens. See, sometimes we need to hear things over and over and over and over because, I mean, listen, these are my messages that I'm putting together, and I don't always get all these things, so I need to hear them over and over and over. So we have victory in battle when we keep our focus on the Lord. Our eyes must be fixed on Jesus because guess what? I, I don't know if you know this. There's a lot of distracting things out there that will get your attention. They're designed to get your attention and to pull you away from what is most important, and that's Jesus. Now, it says, as as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. When he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. This whole concept of, of losing focus. Now, I want you guys to, to picture this. Just Moses would, would hold his hands up like this. And so as long as he did that, the, the, the Israelites were winning. Now, I can do this for a while. But has anybody ever like painted a ceiling or installed a ceiling fan or a light or even screwed in a light bulb that just wouldn't go in, right? Or do, Anybody ever worked above your head for, for very long and you're like, this is awful, right? And so, I mean, I'm like, what, 30 seconds in and I can already feel it. Can you imagine all day long holding up your hands and you'd be like, man, I'm getting tired, you know, just, you know, you want to shake them out and then boom, as soon as that happens, the Amalekites start winning the battle. So he has to put his hands back up. And, and he's, it, it wasn't just the fact that he had his hands up. He was holding this staff, this important staff. And so many times, if I may, many times, please let this go, okay? You know, we, we I'm going to step over the carpet just in case things go south here, okay? We, we think of it like this, right, that he's holding the staff, but I'm, I'm, whoever's this is, I'm holding the iPad, okay? Um, so he's actually holding a staff like this, we, we believe, I, I think. And we'll see that in a couple minutes. But imagine doing this all day long of holding up this staff. Your arms would get tired. So whenever, please, Lord. Stay. Okay. 
So whenever his hands would go down, the Amalekites would start to prevail. Um, So when we lose that focus, even if it's just a picture of holding something up, God was like, no, 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 up towards me so everyone can see the staff, so everyone can see the thing that I have designated to signify I am with you. And when people would lose sight of that because Moses would have to shake it out or do whatever or get tired, that's when they lost their focus. Verse 12, when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. Now, now pictures. Can I get a couple of volunteers up here just for fun? Zach? All right, come on. Javi, you want to help me? You're right there. All right. So, all right. So we're here. I don't know how long it took for Moses to say, guys, I, I just, I'm, I can't do this. So they get a stone and they, they put it behind him. So this is a stone. We're using all kinds of awesome props today, right? Okay. So, so they put this stone. He's got his hands up so he can be lowered. And he's like, okay. All right, guys, I, that, that's great. I appreciate the seat, but it's really my arms. Really, you know, thanks, Zach, a lot. I appreciate it. It's cool. Um, but my, my arms are getting tired. So can you guys just come, like, okay, so now that's cool, but they would probably get tired too, right? But I want you guys to see the picture of this. What's going on here? I, 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 okay, Moses was the chosen man of God to hold up the staff, but he's got two strong men right next to him, and I don't just mean buff, okay? I meant like strong, I know, right, see? I meant like, like strong men of faith that are right there holding up his arms. Thank you, guys. He thought I was gonna make you stay the whole time, right? Yeah, give them a round of applause because they stood there for one minute. Okay, um, Here's our third point. Simple followers of Jesus know we were never made to do life and faith alone. God did not create us to do life alone. And maybe you feel like that. Maybe you feel like you're doing this alone, but that's not how God created it. Proverbs 27, 17. This is one of my favorite verses. Um, one of my best friends in the world, Josh Morris, some of you guys know him. He's a pastor in Hawaii, and um, we, we don't talk often. We talk maybe every four to six weeks or so, but when we do, we talk for like an hour. Um, but this is our verse together, okay? We, we have a verse. Yes, isn't that cute? We have like this little bromance thing going on, right? But this is our verse. Iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another, like, like we, and, and, and I'm, I'm, he's more of the iron. I'm kind of more like tinfoil, okay? But like when we, when we just talk, we just encourage each other and we, we lift each other up and, hey, what are you, what are you preaching about recently? What's, what's God doing in your life? And we have these conversations and like I, I get off of the phone with him and I'm like, all right, let's go. I feel like energized and recharged. And see, that's, how God created us to live. Galatians 6, 2, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. We need to carry each other's burdens. We're not made to carry our own burdens alone. Romans 12, 5, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. I love this picture that Paul is giving of all of the members or all of the parts of a body. And you have the hands and the feet and the head and the ears and the eyes and, and all of these different parts. And none of them can function without the rest of the body. Individually, on their own, they're basically no good. They're just dead flesh. But you put all of those pieces together and it makes one whole body and that's the picture of the church. Not just Island Community Church, although we have that here, but the Big C Church, God's Church. 
We put all of us together with all of our different skills and giftings and those of you who could put Ikea furniture together and like, you know, prayer and and all of those spiritual gifts. You put everyone together and you just have this body that just can move forward the kingdom of God. And that is how God created this. Here's another couple verses. I didn't put them up there. You can write down the passages. 1 Corinthians 12 Ecclesiastes chapter 4, so many passages in Scripture that say we were never made to do life alone. And I'm sorry if you feel that way. And, and see, that goes for many areas of life. We're, we're, we shouldn't do life alone. Now, I'm going to say this the best way that I can. Have you ever looked at someone And in the very least judgmental way possible, you thought, you should have asked somebody before you walked out of the house in that. (laughs) Right? Again, I'm I'm not being judgmental. And and, and listen, I was in Miami all day yesterday, okay? So it's hard. I get it, right? But like, (laughs) that person needed somebody in their life to say, uh, uh, no, just no, right? We need those people around us. And, and that goes for just regular life, like just what you're wearing. And again, I'm not being judgmental about that. I'm just saying we need people in our lives that are, are willing and able to speak truth. To say, hey, you knucklehead, knock it off. What are you thinking? That's not honoring God. Don't you notice what's happening Don't you notice that what you're doing, how you're living is destructive? Why would you do that? Just, just let, and have somebody that would have the courage and the love to speak that into your life. And if, if you're, if you're lacking a spiritual brother or sister that that has authority to speak into your life, I'm just going to tell you, you are so susceptible to the enemy's schemes. Not having that iron sharpening you, not calling you out when they need to, we've got to put people in our lives that are willing to do that. We were never, ever made to do life or faith alone. Back to our passage here. Last few verses, it says, Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. Man, that must have been so long. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and watch this, and make sure that Joshua hears it. Really interesting. It's the first time we've heard of Joshua. Now we keep hearing about him over and over and over. And he says, because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Why would it be so important that Joshua hears that? Because Joshua would be the next leader of the Israelites. And they would constantly be battling against these people. And Joshua needed to know, he needed to have that encouragement, I will get victory. I'm not going to tell you when, but I will have victory over the Amalekites. Verse 15, Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. Now remember a few weeks ago we talked about the names of God and we had like uh, Jehovah Jireh, my God provides. Well, the Lord is my banner is another one of those names. It's Jehovah Nisi. And the picture of a banner is a a, a covering. And again, that's why his his hands raised up like this was almost like a a picture of a banner, you know, over uh, this battle that was happening down in this valley. And the Lord is my banner. We need to live like that, church. Like there is a banner over us that God's protection and his presence and his covering is over this. And we live sometimes sheepishly and cowardly. And don't think that we can go out into this world and, and, and be a force for Jesus. I don't want us to live as cowards. 
I want us to live like there is this banner over us, like we can charge hell with a squirt gun and not even worry about it. That's the kind of faith that God is looking from us. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. That's pretty cool. Did you know that when people fight against you, like if you are in Christ and you are, you are following Jesus and you are trying to do his will in your life and people are fighting against that, they're not actually fighting against you, they're fighting against the Lord. Remember Saul? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute all of the Jews that you are? No. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Jesus said when Saul ran into Jesus on the road to Damascus. God will get the victory over his enemies. Always. Every single time. God always gets victory. It may not be how we want it. It may not be how we think it should go down. It may not be in the timing that we think. But God always gets victory over the enemies of his people. That ought to just do something inside your heart to know, hey, God is for me, and if God is for me, who can be against me? So, so I am ready. I am ready to really live out this life of faith because I have a God that cares more about me than anything else. Like, he cared enough to send the most precious thing to him, his son Jesus, to die for me. He's not going to just leave you out to dry. I want to ask the band to come forward. And like we said, we're, we're doing things a little bit differently starting off today. And, and Jake and I have been talking for a while. Here at the end of service, we want to create some space for you guys. We want to create an opportunity maybe for you to respond. Maybe for you, maybe, maybe God's been poking at your heart with something today. Maybe I said something that was like, oh, I, that's me. I, I, I need to work on that. I need prayer. I need to respond to Jesus. And so that's, that's kind of what we want to do in this time. We want you to be able to respond because I don't want to just come up here and, and give a message and everybody's like, great message, and everybody goes home and that's it. I want us to be able to take this message and truly apply it to our lives and see where we are lacking maybe in some areas, where we need some encouragement. And so that's what we want to do this morning. So would you guys stand? And in a minute, we're just, we're going to sing, but I just want to go through our points here and, and maybe, maybe just see if one of these hits you. So our first point was simple followers of Jesus don't use God as a good luck charm. Maybe, maybe that's you. Maybe recently you've been just like, I've been more about just kind of the habit of going to church or just God as my fire insurance or I really only do, you know, just go to God when I need something. Today's the day that we say, no, no, no. I want to fully give my life to Jesus. Maybe it's number two. Simple followers of Jesus know we have victory in battle when our focus is on the Lord. Maybe you've lost focus. Maybe something else has stolen your attention away. Like I said, there are things designed in this world that you see multiple times a day that are designed to take your focus away from what's truly important. So maybe that's you. Or number three, simple followers of Jesus know we were never made to do life or our faith alone. Maybe you do feel like you are going through this life and you are alone. And maybe you are. 
I want to encourage you that this is a great church. And I don't just say that because I'm the pastor of this church, but because I truly believe like this is a great church to get connected to. That we have so many people here that love to walk alongside of people. I can tell you story after story after story of people that just wandered in here and now are just completely assimilated in. That they have people that have the courage and the strength and the love to hold them accountable in their lives, to encourage them, to carry their burdens with them. So I want to pray for us right now and just give us an opportunity for God to speak into our hearts to say, maybe that's me. Maybe you need to respond this morning. So let's pray. God, we come before you this morning, just broken people. God, we are basically capable of nothing on our own. But God, we know your word says us, tells us that you are everything, that you equip us that you encourage us, that you bring us joy, that you bring us strength. You bring us love, companionship, friendship. God, that the creator of the universe would want to be our friend. That blows my mind. So God, right now in this moment, I I just ask that your spirit would just speak to hearts. God, speak to people. Let them know what it is they need. Tell us, God, what it is that we need to change in our lives to get more in tune with you. And God, I know that there are probably people in this room that do not have a relationship with you. That they have just maybe relied on other things. Maybe they have relied on their good works or their church attendance or a family member's faith, just that they would be good enough to get into heaven. And God, your word doesn't say that. Your word says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So right now in this moment, God, convict hearts. If they need a relationship with you, God, speak to their hearts and tell them, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you right now this morning, if you don't have an actual relationship with Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Right there where you're standing, would you just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I want you in my life. I trust that you died for me. I trust that you hung on a cross and shed your blood to take away my sin. God, save me. God, change me. I give you my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that for the first time this morning, I would love to know. I'm not going to call you up front. I'm not going to do anything like that, but... I would just love to know to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, today is the day I got it. Today is the day I started a relationship with Jesus. Just slip your hand up if you would. God, you are so good. You are so good, God. Convict us where we need convicting. And God, use this time right now as an opportunity for us to respond to the gospel, to respond to your word. God, I know that there are some here who may need prayer. Maybe they just want to come and pray up front. But God, be honored by this time as we sing and we give glory to you. We pray all of this in the awesome and powerful name of Jesus. If you want, if you need, you can come forward, you can come up for prayer. We've got people that will be down here that can speak to you. Or if you just want to come up and pray, or if you want to know more about a relationship with Jesus, you can come up and see us. But let's sing.